Welcome to this episode of Compose, an interview podcast for software developers interested in the Rust programming language. My name is Tim Clicks, more formally Tim McNamara, and I'm on the planet to build a better planet. In this episode, I interview Nell Shamrock Harrington about the growth of Rust to this point and its prospects into the future. I learned so much from Nell during this discussion, and I think that you will too. So welcome, Nell. Thank you so much for very much um, being very gracious with your time. You happen to be the lead editor of This Week in Rust. You are the Microsoft representative, as I understand it, for the Rust Foundation that serves Rust users globally, uh, as well as just being a steward, I think, for um, for Rust and you are doing uh, just a ton of outreach for this language. So thank you so much for joining us here on Compose. Thanks so much for having me here, Tim. It's uh, always great to talk to you and it's great to talk to your audience as well. <laughs> I, I hope I have an audience. Like I, the, uh, It's been a fascinating journey of becoming a bit of a podcaster. It's something that I really wanted to do for a long time, but I kind of figured that the world doesn't need like another white guy talking about technology. And so part of my strategy is like learning a lot. So if you kind of have any yeah. comments, both from the audience perspective or from you as a, as an interviewee, um, very, 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 and very encouraging of people's, um, thoughts. Uh, so that sounds great. And it's always a, a give and take, uh, when you're learning and when you're teaching, like I have your, uh, rest in action book on my bookshelf over there, huh. uh, which I did learn new things uh, when I read it. So thank you so much for that book. Oh, that's my pleasure. No, it's, uh, it was a bit of a grind. Well, actually, you know, it was a serious grind getting that thing done. But and the publisher is very adamant that we will get a an updated edition for the twenty twenty four edition of Rust. Nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, and now I've made that promise to the world, so I guess that's happening. Um, it's out there now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about community and growing sure. community. Rust has been growing exponentially for at least a decade, probably longer. Um, and some point, and I'm curious as to your perspective on just maybe this is a provocative statement, but I think that the, uh, the community is kind of changing or the needs of the growth, the new wave are people that kind of, that have slightly different needs to the people who were super excited about a brand new sparkling language, uh, let's say five years ago. It is. It, you know, as any community grows, it does change. And I think, you know, I remember when I keynoted RustConf, I think it was 2021, uh, and that was about the history of the This Week in Rust newsletter. And I went through and, you know, this was long before I became lead editor or even was subscribed to it, went through some of the early issues. And so much of it is around people who are very excited, not even about the use of the programming language yet, but the creation of the programming language. You know, people who are working directly on the compiler, working directly on the language. And certainly those people are still in our community and those areas have grown. But as the Rust usage has exploded, especially over the past maybe five years or something like that, uh, different people are coming in with different needs. I mean, I can say I started using Rust, it was around 2017. I was working at a uh, infrastructure startup called Chef. Uh, which also had a very active community and I was involved in both as an engineer and in stewarding the community there. Schiff was a Ruby shop. It was. And then they started experimenting with Erling. That was right before I joined in 2015. And then our, the then CTO, uh, Adam Jacob, had an idea for a new distributed systems software project. And Russ was just, this was... I think this this was past 1.0, uh, but it still was fairly early in the Rust uh, Rust maturity model. And uh, he wanted to write it in Rust because Rust, as we know, works very, very well for distributed systems. So I wanted to work on that project. I had been doing Ruby stuff initially. So I read the Rust book and there did the Rust links exercises and there were definitely some things I didn't understand. And what struck me about the Rust community then, as well as now, is, you know, there was a Discord channel, I think it was, for basic Rust questions. And I went in with some of what I thought were very basic questions, but just things that I was a little bit confused about. No one ever reacted poorly, no matter what the question was. I, I 
well, you know, in Ru- this is going to date me a little bit, but in Rust, uh, no one calls you a noob when mm-hmm. you ask a question. So I liked the language because it was good for this distributed system software project. And I like the ergonomics of it. Love how the compiler guides you to making the right coding decisions. But I stayed in it because of the community and I continue to stay in it because of the community. Were you on the IRC channel? I checked it out once or twice, uh, but I mainly was uh, conversing with the community via Discord, via GitHub, also Twitter uh, in, yeah. in in those years. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that the... Yeah, I was never into the IRC channel. I um, It seemed a little bit to well no i don't want to say this it was probably never exclude i never felt like that was a place for me to come with my beginner questions like it was for people essentially mozilla employees discussing right. developing the language that's kind of the impression that i got even though it was much much problematic anyway so this is like quite a while ago yeah <laughs> it was it was it was several years ago and in 2019 i'd been Helping the Rust community, I was on the governance working group, figuring out how to govern the Rust open source project as it grew and grew and grew. And at that point, uh, Nico reached out to me and said, we have an open position on my team at Mozilla working on the Rust language full time. Would you be interested in, in applying? And I was and got in, started there in February 2020. You can imagine where this is going. Uh, right before you right, run right as everything in the world was changing and unfortunately was laid off in August 2020, along with 25 percent of Mozilla, but made a lot of context there. Did my first uh, two RFCs, I think one was around governance and GitHub permissions and the other was around async. Uh, and I really liked it. So I fortunately was able to continue much of that work at Microsoft when I joined there. You mean you like the RFC process and kind of enabling community via kind of creating these exactly. governance structures? Yeah. You know, in, in open source, technical skills have to be people skills, have to be technical skills. There's an, It's absolutely necessary to have both sets of skills to be a leader in open source, at least. And I liked that being with the Rust community, it harnessed both of those aspects of my brain and I could use them to the betterment of Rust stations and also the betterment of uh, anyone who used Rust or was interested in the language but hadn't made the jump just yet. Mm-hmm. What do you think that the comments that you, when you were nudging people towards Rust, let's say eight years ago or five years ago or... Do you think that that conversation has changed more recently? Uh, I would say people are more open to it. Uh, the, you know, it, it, there we can point to many examples now of Rust being used in very high profile software in applications and across, you know, the big tech, big tech, I say that in quotations, Mark. Uh, it's pretty Mark's, big these uh, days. These are trillion dollar it companies. <laughs> it is indeed. Yeah. And they are using Rust and mm. betting big on Rust. So I'd say there's much more awareness of it. It's not a niche language anymore, or at least it won't be for very much longer. So there's, I think, a mu- much more openness about Rust. That said, if you're talking to someone who's very, very invested in C or C++, a lot of the conversation is still very, very similar uh, in regards to, you know, why don't you, you know, on the most more toxic side, why don't you just hire C++ developers who know what they're doing? Well, we've been doing that for decades and we still have all these security issues related to memory safety uh, to no one's going to want to learn Rust. People are learning Rust uh, to uh, there's not enough tools for it. There are more tools for it. So we're working through it, but like any kind of change, like I mentioned, Chef was an infrastructure star- startup, very much a, you know, part of the early DevOps movement. Whenever there's, it's not just the tool that's changing, that there's the culture that needs to change too. There's a lot of resistance, but the only way to work through it is to approach it with empathy and understanding that someone who's been coding the same way for decades, all of a sudden hearing you know, there's a new language coming in. This new language might be replacing the language I've spent decades, you know, building up all this knowledge in my head about. There's there's a feeling of being threatened. And 
the, the conversation needs to be de-escalated first, and then you can bring in the reasons for rust and other things. I learned that from the book, uh, Crucial Conversations, which was probably the most useful book for me, both in professional communications and in my personal life communications too. Yeah, it is threatening. I it mean, is, imagine yeah. being told, well, your knowledge is obsolete. It, that's how it feels. Right. At least, it is, In fact, yeah. it's worse now because we get messages like, well, if you if you go and decide we're going to start a pro large project in C, C or C++, or I don't think there's anyone writing systems programs in, let's say, Pascal or Fortran, or like this would have been like in C or C++, you're also being told that essentially you are exposing your users to to unstable software and right. uh, security vulnerabilities, and you're exposing the company to a lot of um, liability. So essentially, you're you're being negligent as a professional. Now that is threatening, uh, but unfortunately, I think in some cases it's actually true. Um, it is. Uh, the I had a conversation, this was in work, this is not revealing anything confidential, but someone expressed to me the reason they preferred C++ to Rust was they felt C++ trusted the developer to use it in a safe language. When Rust says, thou shalt use this in a safe way, unless you specifically say you won't. And I think, you know, 20 years ago, we could rely on careful developer knowledge and uh you know extensive code review but there's way too much software now there's yeah. way too much code we are produce i don't even know how much we're producing every day <laughs> not to say of uh, uh, you know the extensive systems that we have to maintain still there's too much for it, it to be a human be left only to the human being to ensure that the users of their software are safe yeah i i and I mean, even if you were to say, well, we'll put a static analyzer and put that mm -hmm. behind it, you know, as part of the CI pipeline. Well, that feels to me almost a bit late. Like, yeah. why don't you put it at the front? <laughs> like you're part of the it, compilation. It to, yeah. And, yeah. The developer needs to see it immediately. It's like running tests uh, and other things that you, you need those short, fast feedback loops. And I was, I did an interview with MIT Tech Review. And I made this as an offhand comment and they published it. Fortunately, it didn't get a negative reaction the way I was thinking it might. But when I write a C++ program and I get a compiler error, it makes me feel like I'm a horrible person. Mm. It's like I'm at, you know, the Thanksgiving dinner as a kid. I say, say something. Everyone just goes quiet. And I have no idea what I just said. But apparently I said something wrong and it's up to me to figure out what that was. With Rust, I hear people talking about fighting the borrow checker and such. But it feels much more like a guide you know, guiding me to the, the correct solution or the best way to write my software. It's not left to me alone. Yeah, I feel yeah. like the compiler is a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it's a slightly different model, but it's essentially not just doing its work, but it's also pr helping helping you to to write the program that you want. And mm -hmm. it's in the, the comment that, oh, well, we could just hire better developers or we um you should just know your programs later or i yeah. want to compile Get that. good yeah. <laughs> I, yeah that's right or i think that you should just allow the compiler to just trust me the compiler is the, sorry computers are really good at some things that humans are very bad at very well. for, such as counting <laughs> And mm -hmm. like checking and like numbers generally. And why don't we just ask the computers to do the things that they're really good at? Right. Um, but there is a, I mean, it must feel, so Microsoft is a very big place and it has lots Huge. of software. Yeah. But I still feel that it must be very challenging for languages that are outside of the .NET ecosystem to sort of feel welcome there. Is It can be. Uh, you know, it has improved is my understanding. Um, but you know, so much of Microsoft's developer focused products are very, at, at least at this time, are very, very focused on the .NET ecosystem. Um, a lot of the paid developer products, things like Visual Studio, uh, are focused on, you know, .NET C++ ecosystem. 
And that can make it feel strange when you bring in a language that is not one of those big ones. Uh, or that, you know, and, and Microsoft has, and this is good, extensive developer, to, internal developer tooling that people are very, very used to in adding in support for additional languages. It takes a lot of investment uh, in order. I mean, I, I think it's, when we add something to Windows, and there is Rust in Windows now, that is public, uh, at least some parts of it. At least Mark Rusinovich, CTO of Azure, tweeted it, so I'm assuming it's public. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 when we put something in Windows, we commit to supporting it for 10 years, uh, a full decade. So there's a resistance to change, not necessarily just for change's sake, but as a you know the, that, that need for stability that is expected of us. Uh, so, and you know, how you work through that is you make your case, well, this actually makes us more stable for this reason, this reason, this reason, or this is why we should focus on adding this to our developer tooling to achieve these business objectives. You do always have to tie it to a business objective of producing software that is more secure for our customers. And to be frank, keeps us off the cover of Forbes or something like that because of, I, at least makes it less likely that we'll uh, be on the cover of Forbes because of a mass security incident. No one wants that. No, no. I can imagine that very few people were very happy when they, yeah, there have been a couple of pretty majors. Um, there have. Uh, uh, when I'm waking up to texts from family members who are not involved in tech about, <laughs> it's a, it's it's a rude wake up call in in more ways than one. Yeah, right. Because you have to be a, you're suddenly a, a public figure, or you're an ambassador for Microsoft, and you're somehow involved with programming languages at right. Microsoft, and so suddenly you get texts. Um, that's a, that's a bad day, or at least yeah. Um, the next question I think that's worthwhile to ask is: Do you think that Rust has sort of outgrown the systems programming language? Banner? I think if it has not already, it's on the verge of it. A lot of people like Rust, you know, not just because it's great in, in, in systems programming, but they like the ergonomics of the language a lot. Uh, we see that with Wasm. Uh, we see that with, uh, there's game development in in uh, going on in Rust. Uh, one of my favorite talks of RustConf, which was just last week in Montreal, was uh, Nathan Stocks live coded a game in 25 minutes. Uh, and then had people in the audience with Xbox controllers, and they were able to play it by the end. It was really, really cool. Nice. I think because people like the ergonomics of the language, like having something like the borrow checker guiding them on how to write better code, I do. It is certainly systems programming is probably what it's always going to be most known for, but it has certainly outgrown just being a systems programming language. It's funny, actually, that we categorize things like this. It's like, if from like, other forms of creativity, like is it a novel or is it a novella? Right. Like, like, does that does, does these sort of categories do they even mean anything? Like, is it a limited series or is it a TV? Series? You, you, I, right. The Emmys were just last night. Okay. So this is fresh okay. In my mind. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and you could do the same thing. Uh, yeah. The, and the reason why I think it's important though is because when communicating about this programming language that I personally feel is going is essentially the best thing that ha has happened to the technology industry in a long time and has the potential to dramatically improve the stability, security, and like reliability of software systems for like two or three generations. Like I, I think it's that important. Um, and, but if people, it's almost... I wonder about labels and whether or not they start to do harm as you essentially like mm -hmm. Rust is growing or outgrowing it. However, people that uh, align themselves with that term as well and say, I'm a systems programmer. Like I do quote serious stuff. Right. Like I build operating. I use the terminal. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, you know, like, oh yeah, I build a database. I build, I do this. Like I build real, real programs. Uh, there is this kind of conflict, like a cultural conflict happening, I think, inside Rust. I mean, Rust is big enough to have, you know, it's quite famously for its, quote, Rust drama of, um, right. but I think one which of... Which when someone brings, oh, sorry, whenever someone brings that up to me, well, Rust 
I like the programming language, but it just has so much drama. I say every single other programming language community has just as much, if not more drama. Rust just does it more publicly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Or you find any grouping of individuals yeah. or that has more than a million people contributing or have a, having a stake into it. And you find me, like, you could go to a little town hall, like, during the election campaign for a little town that has, like, six, say, 60,000 people. There's going to be more drama in that nine-week election campaign, let's say, for the mayoralty <laughs> than I think I, what Russ is. I've worked in politics, and I can confirm that. <laughs> what you say is true. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, it's actually, yeah, I. I do want to hold on to that idea of essentially, well, yeah. well how does Rust essentially outgrow or uh, like outmaneuver people who say, who just kind of discard it now because of, uh, you know, Rust is this or like, there's a bunch of other comments, but the the thing is that or Rust has a web development community or a game development community and they're kind of like sliding to the side of each other. Um, they might be systems people over here and in, in one corner and is is that like how do we is that something that needs to be managed can that i'm not even sure if this is a real I question think, so i think awareness is helpful mm -hmm. uh someone once said to me about this week in rust one of the reasons they liked it was they saw all the different applications there are for rust like rust in uh you know, data science, not a huge thing by any means, but there are people experimenting with that. And it's a way for people to connect with each other and find other people that are in that use case. You know, something that just struck me talking to you is Rust, it's kind of doing the reverse of what JavaScript did. In that, you know, when I first learned, learned JavaScript in 2004, I was a college student, it was purely a web development language. You used it to, uh, you know, do things with your frames on your HTML page and have funny little animations, like little animated otters or something. I uh, now it's used in game development, in systems programming with Node.js, less less commonly used, but it certainly is used for that. It's even used in distributed systems. You know, it. I think when we find a really good tool, people want to use it in all sorts of different use cases. And I think the way to avoid classifying it as only one or only one or two use cases is to make sure there's awareness. Uh, when I've been the program chair of Rust Comp a few times, I've been on the program committee every year since 2020. And one thing we always try to do is showcase, uh, by the way, selecting uh, the program for a conference is really, really hard. It's pretty gut wrenching work. Don't but tell me this because do... I'm trying. I'm pro like sort of proposing a conference for about this time next year uh, on my uh, side of the world. Uh, but... we'll, we'll take that offline. Okay. <laughs> um, but <laughs> right. but it it's one thing we do always try to do is have a showcase of different use cases for sure. Rust. Uh, make sure there's a talk or two about it being used in game dev. Make sure there's a talk or two about it being used in uh, web. Uh, even in databases, we had one of the talks was from one of the maintainers of the MongoDB Rust driver. Uh, yeah, it's it's part of community is the or part of the value of community is we understand what other people are doing and we connect with people whose interests are similar to ours. So at run at some point, Rust is also and it's already there, but it will continue to grow. That Rust will kind of become its own ecosystem upon which more is growing. So there'll be people mm -hmm. that there'll be some other language probably written in Rust that essentially spawns on its own kind of little fractal it world. Um, and Rust is actually, I, this is the wrong word and I apologize to everyone, but Rust is infecting Python pretty in a pretty major way. Mm -hmm. So for example, yeah. a lot of, um, a lot of tooling is being written in Rust. So things like linters, for example, and the package managers, or at least mm -hmm. proposed to be written in Rust. And I think a lot of that supporting infrastructure for well, like developer tooling seems to be quite easy to write productively with Rust. Um, yeah, there are the kind of all of these points where Rust the becomes like the invader or mm -hmm. 
the, the intruder. And yeah. you mentioned empathy earlier. And I wonder. Uh, I mentioned what was that? Sorry? The word empathy. And yes. like essentially being thoughtful is kind of how I interpret it. And I just wanted to see like, if you were proposing to rewrite the gym command for Ruby, let's say, mm -hmm. like, how would you do that in a way that is empathetic to what is already there? Right. Uh, something I tell people internally at Microsoft, uh, just rewrite everything in Rust is a meme. It's not real. <laughs> it's that that's not reality by any means. Uh, approaching it with empathy, you know, it's the same as, you know, coming to any open source project, let's say, uh, you know, my first uh, open source contribution was to the documentation for a wrapper around the MailChimp API. Cool. It was called Gibbon. And anything beyond, you know, maybe a uh, hundred line code line change or something like that, you really should talk to the maintainer first. Uh, number one, to ask, you know, does it fit with their plan for the project? And two, it's a way to just make that first point a personal contact uh, contact with them. I can tell you as an open source maintainer, oh, it's heartbreaking to get you know thousands of lines of code. And someone's clearly spent weeks, if not months, on this feature that they think the project needs, but it's just not the right thing for that project at that time. And saying no to that is hard. So it's so much easier and saves so much time and so many emotions if someone comes to me as the maintainer first to talk about it. So I'd say, let's say you want to rewrite some sort of Unix utility written in C in Rust. I would approach the maintainer and say, I'd like to experiment with a Rust implementation of, the, um, implementation of this tool. Uh, would that be okay by you? Or mm. would that potentially interfere with anything that you have uh, in progress rather than showing up? Uh, with a well, giant you... pull request, rewriting in Rust, or this is worse, making a hard fork and rewriting it in Rust without talking to the maintainer first. Uh, I think, yeah, that empathy and communication is key. Yeah, I don't want to name names be, to be to sort of uh, embarrass anybody, but I think that he won't mind uh, me um, mentioning it. Um, so this is actually, I think, a problem that I had with um, John Jensitz. Um, he rewrote Flame Graph, mm -hmm. um, which was originally written by Brendan. Um, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, quickly, quickly, search, search, search. Um, and he now works at Intel, and his name is Brendan Gregg. Excuse me. Um, now... I happened to bump into to Brendan just and he and he and then started talking about Rust and he was like, "Why well, there was a Rust implementation of my Flame Graph tool, which admittedly was kind of a Perl script that wasn't particularly flexible, et cetera, et cetera." But he was still kind of irritated that mm -hmm. John didn't kind of say, "Oh, by the way, I just thought of like I love what you've done, and I just thought I'd try it out to see how we could." create recreated in rust kind of as a bit of a and would you be okay in terms of the way that this is communicated to the world etc cetera, etc cetera. and um yeah i this almost raises a different point and that is if you're quite prominent in a community suddenly that your actions and your words have a lot of weight and right. i wonder whether or not you, this is something that you've had to deal with as you've taken on additional or as your career has grown and you've suddenly realized well i'm responsible people are listening to the things that i say and was that a process of uh how did that process affect you as someone who's like being an advocate right it's it is a weighty responsibility and i you know left twitter about a year ago or so, uh, mainly because it was really awful for my mental health. I, sure. you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, community dramas or other things like that. Just, it was giving me panic attacks and those suck. Uh, no one mm -hmm. deserves those. And I think with 
when you're someone prominent or even someone not prominent and you make a statement, it might be an offhand tweet or something like that, uh, you know, a snarky comment about someone else's project. I saw this happen when I was at Chef. Uh, and that person takes great offense to it and reacts in an inflammatory way. Uh, social media algorithms really fan that flame. It goes it goes nuclear pretty darn fast. Yeah. And, and yeah, right. we as people who people listen to and potentially, you know, re retweet or re whatever our messages and such, we have a responsibility to be careful what we're saying before before we say it. Yeah, I mean the, and I, I thank you very much for sharing that. I um, pretty saddened to hear that anxiety has affected you. In a way, I mean, I've um, also had really significant issues while I've been on my own with um, with kind of uh, sort of related issues, and but not in the same sense because I'm not a woman in technology. Um, like I am, I don't. Uh, sorry, and that means that I am shielded by a huge, like wave of just viral. Sorry, viri. <laughs> just, no, that's the wrong word. To, I was going to say. Uh, I was thinking of a word that has to be. Um, I understand. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just, just like let's say torrent is is is, is vitriol. Is, vitriol is what I meant. Yeah, there we there go. go. Yeah. Nice. I apologize for everyone who just kind of totally took my what I said. And anyway, so yeah, there's kind of like this, and it's it's like a worst of humanity, really. It's like mm -hmm. it's very interesting that we ostensibly are very good at creating communication systems. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking to each other. I'm recording this from this interview remotely. This is something that people who started podcasting would never have been able to do. We would have probably. But we would have been able to like record things on Skype or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't created systems which are very good at resolving conflict, right? Sort of at scale or like, like scale in terms of distance, for example, or like crossing cultural boundaries, um, as well as another thing. And instead, this, our communication systems tend to ratchet up aggression and they yeah these the algorithms are obviously like fed through advertising dollars and therefore want to share things that are likely to engage some sort of response and have can kind of have a very like this whole engagement bait process and um but there is one part of the internet in fact there are some parts of the internet that have resisted this and one of them is actually this week in rust Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this week in Rust has a very interesting editorial policy. In fact, I shared something on Reddit. I was like, mm. "It's almost as though the editors of This Week in Rust are sort of taking a very." Uh, I think that there's a there's a, there's essentially this is my take. I haven't seen the editorial policy, so I, I here's my guess. Someone sh shares a link. If it's clear that they have the, uh, created in good faith and it like is not some sort of trivial thing, it goes on. It mm -hmm. goes on the list. And if it's not, not quite in the right category, that doesn't really matter. Um, we'll move it. We'll yeah, move, we'll yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're, uh, we're pretty good at that, yeah. Um, but it's not as though This Week in Rust is like a heavily curated like top five links right. in Rust this week. Like, it's not attempting to be that. Is that accurate? That is very correct. Uh, so something I've been asked about many times. So on This Week in Rust, it says, This Week in Rust is sponsored by the Rust Foundation. Uh, all that means is they pay the hosting costs for it. Uh, and particularly for the email uh, hosting costs or the mailing list costs, those are pretty significant. So we're very, very grateful to the foundation for doing that. I have been approached many times from by companies saying, hey, we'd like to you know, what are your rates for sponsorship? We'd love to sponsor it and then be featured on on your newsletter. And if I'm honest, the, the, re the reason I always say no is I don't want the headache of managing that. Uh, and, uh, right. Managing payments and other, and other things. But two, we're a community-driven uh, 
newsletter first and foremost. And one of the things we always want is for our newsletter, you know, to be accurate, to present many different points of view when it comes to, you know, using the technology we're also interested in. But one of our editorial rules is we don't publish things that are just rants uh, or that are very, very negative yeah. uh, about, you know, and, and I mean by negative in a you know, vitriol kind of way mm -hmm. uh, about people on the project, about uh, you know, certain aspects of the project. We don't publish those. That said, uh, something, uh, you know, it's it's no secret that there's been some controversies around things the Rust Foundation has done over the past couple of years. When articles about those come out, and often they're, they're very factual articles about them, what I do is I say I have a conflict. There are several other editors besides me on This Week in Rust, and they're all fantastic. Uh, what I do is I say I have a conflict of interest in this, in that I'm on the board of the Rust Foundation. Um, I need the other editors to make the decision on whether to include this or not, uh, whether it meets our, our standards or not for including a link. And if they say we're going to include it, and we all know what those are, and they're all in the, the README uh, of, of the This Week in Rust GitHub repo, uh, we do include it. So we are looking for things yeah, that are factual. And it's OK. I mean, we have an observ observations and thoughts section, which is for people's observations and thoughts. But we never want to inflame the community or inflame anyone with the content of our newsletter. Uh, something that some people might remember this, we used to include uh, job postings in This Week in Rust. Mm. And I, it was hard because a lot of Rust is used in a lot of uh, cryptocurrency related companies. And there are members of the community who very strongly believe that those uses, and I'm not taking a position on this, but those uses are immoral uh, in one way or another. I mean, Rust is used in defense tech. There are some people who very strongly feel that is an immoral use. So we had all these requests from community members and, you know, very, you know, well-intentioned requests for us to, you know, exclude certain industries or exclude certain companies based on those companies you know, in one case, there was a New York Times article, which you know, explained all the really toxic things that were happening at this company. And my res response, and you know, I discussed this with my editors, and their response too was, we are a group of volunteers, and we cannot possibly screen uh, every job posting that comes our way, particularly because there's a lot more job postings involving Rust right now. So we are going to remove that section of the newsletter and link everyone to the who's hiring thread in uh, uh, the Rust subreddit, which uh, there's a new one uh, every time a new edition of, or not edition, new version. What is it? New update of Rust? The new release. New release. There That's you go. the word That's I was looking word. for. It's yes. not, it's which not, is every, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Words are hard, which is every six weeks. So we, in that Subreddit, you know, that thread usually is pretty well, cur may not curated, but managed by the community and managed by the heroic moderators of the This Weekend or the Rust subreddit. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, it's interesting. When I say it's interesting to me, hopefully to others. So the only downside from my point of view of that is that, like, actually, no, I think it's really healthy that you took, you decided, look, actually, that's, too hard and this is essentially like not what we signed up for uh, or something like i think it's actually really important to prioritize your team that's a really really healthy stance and i was a, when i started the sentence i was going to say ah oh, but now we've pushed moderation to right. the reddit so it's like the subreddit moderators however in reality what you've just done like they would have had to moderate them anyway yes Yes, so it's would. actually not adding additional load. It's actually just act what you're doing is you are making their load, uh, or at least you're giving them, let's say, don't think it's equally distributed, like let's say twice as many like views for the same amount of work. So essentially you are increasing the view count to effort kind of ratio or something. Right. And right. yeah, look, it's very um yeah, I, I I would have no I wouldn't 
be particularly helpful if I was in that team because I would say something else, which is that our if we are like if accepting money is too hard, mm. we should accept we should find out how to accept money. Maybe that's routed via the foundation, for example, and we should hire someone to go and look through all of these things right. and say, like, if you want to put a dog posting on, it's going to cost you a hundred bucks or something. Now, uh, now, and there are rust, paid rust job posting sites that that do do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly. But then, like, particularly, like, what it changes the whole dynamic. And I think yeah. it's it's uh like, and in terms of like, where I'm very surprised that you've been able to continue to grow and not be just overrun as Rust has grown. Like, I can't read all of those, all of. Like, <laughs> I don't have enough time to read all of those really I wonderful don't books. I skim it okay. uh, to, 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 see, to, see, to see which ones I'm most interested in. And our community links editors, we have three of them. And we are recruiting more editors, by the way. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, look at the whatever the latest issue of This Week in Rust is, and you'll see a link under the calls for participation for a web forum to, uh, to uh, uh, reach out to us. But our community links editors do a good job of at least, you know, doing a surface scan of every article that comes through. Mm -hmm. And one pattern we noticed, this was a few years ago, uh, there was a company that was had a blog where they put articles about Rust. They were literally taking other people's work and just changing a few uh, you know, word, uh, words in it or a little bit of the word, which is really and not offering any any uh, attribution, which is really not okay. And it was because we had spent so much time scanning or at least had some knowledge in our head of things we may have seen before that we were able to pick that up and we banned uh, that company from, uh, banned their contributions to This Week in Rust. And this is the only time we've done this. We actually went back and uh, deleted their uh, uh, links from our historic archive. We've ne we haven't done that since and I don't, think anything except an extreme situation like that would we actually do that yeah look i mean that's cool actually i think that it i mean it sucks mm -hmm. i don't think that you should feel particularly bad about that i mean it says to me at least as a, a very avid reader of the newsletter and someone who that you have the readership at heart like that's essentially mm -hmm. why you're doing it and i mean i always feel uh i I, I have submitted my own content a few several times now. I remember, yeah, I've reviewed and merged some of them, yeah. <laughs> and I, I always feel like, oh, this is going to make it, like, and yet, uh, it, I, yeah, I'm very touched that it's clear that someone has gone and probably glanced over what I've produced and said, okay, your Tim isn't isn't the kind of person, I mean to just kind of like randomly plagiarize but it's good mm -hmm. to know that that exists like as a check um for the very uh very rare case when that is actually a problem um we do look at everything that is submitted to us uh, if someone uh puts in a pull request into this week in rust or uh at the github repo or submits a link via um, Mastodon or Twitter or such, someone does always look at it. Mm. And so far, we've, we've been able to do that. And uh, we want to continue to be able to do that, so scaling out the team a little bit makes sense. So essentially, do you expect that people have, like, well, horrible word, but let's say a tenure is a better word. I was going to say life cycle, but um, a tenure, let's say, of some period of months where you need to essentially, where you'll contribute, but then you'll find that some people will fade away and uh is is that how things normally work uh well, we have a core group of, i think it's six seven editors at this point um and we work on it um, you know every week mm -hmm. uh that said some of the sections and for some of the sections we're hi we're not hiring but we're recruiting additional editors uh there'll be say two editors let's say we used to have this on the events section uh, where one person will take it for one month and the other person will take it and the other person will take it. And that works really well. Sure. So no one's doing it constantly. And we currently only have one editor on that, so that's part of the reason we're recruiting more. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well. Uh, I certainly do not want anyone to burn out uh, working on This Week in Rust. I was doing that. 
At one point, it was just me and one other person. This was in 2021 or something like that. Uh, and also our publish process at that point was highly manual, and I felt I didn't have time to automate it. Uh, sure. Which yeah, you're never going to... Yeah. Otherwise. And I was... It was a giant burden, or at least felt like it, to do that every single uh, every single week, particularly when I had been laid, just laid off from Mozilla and other things. So, yeah, I think that's a key thing for any open source project is having dedicated people to share the load with. And pe some people come and some people go. You know, other things come up in their life. And as long as they let me know, that's fine. We'll arrange coverage. Uh, we want people, to, we want contribute, working on This Week in Rust to be a joy. Uh, for people, not to be a burden. No, oh, wonderful. That's absolutely amazing. I um, would like to pivot slightly towards sure. the foundation. And yeah. um, so we'll go there via this thing of like, well, the Rust Foundation has a an interesting relationship with mm. many, like it is part of the Venn diagram, like at the center of the Venn diagram, in my opinion. Um, but it is the sponsor of the newsletter. And when the foundation was established, that was probably quite opportunistic. Like there was uh, <clears throat> essentially a need. And now things have become more, uh, Rust has grown up. It has mm -hmm. established a foundation. And yeah. the foundation has kind of also grown up through quite a difficult period, actually. Mm. Um, yes. And... The last, I would say, 18 months have been probably like have been extremely challenging for many of the individuals who work there. I mean, have um, uh, so thank you very much for supporting uh, Beck and the team to as like as they've essentially um, had to to um, carry that burden. Now, we should probably introduce the foundation to people that sure. don't know yeah. what it is. What is the Rust Absolutely. Foundation? <laughs> so the Rust Foundation was starting to be created when I was at Mozilla. And the idea was, you know, Mozilla had been stewarding mm -hmm. the Rust language for a very, very long time. Uh, people were worried, you know, what if Mozilla suddenly lays off the entire Rust team or most of the Rust team? Well, guess what? That actually happened. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so there was a need for an entity that could hold the Rust trademarks. That's that's a big one. Uh, trademarks around the world word Russ around certain marks and also you know have a bank account and be able to be a financial steward for the language now there's been some disagreement on on you know what exactly that means you know how do you get fa uh, funding from the Russ Foundation and that took a lot of time to establish on it but yeah it is essentially oh, it's just an interject entity very, very, very that is quickly. independent uh, just, uh, it is a non-profit c6, c6 um, what Nell is referring to here is the American any tax code. corporate so, entity um, the, uh, and um, it exists to there are steward a small category the a small Rust language class of non-profits that you can have tax uh, that said status the, for in oh, the us ahead. and um rust is the rust foundation is legally incorporated i think as a trade association which essentially oh, is yes. And the worst way of expressing this would be to say, like, you'd use the term lobby group, which, uh, but that isn't quite, essentially, it's made up, um, made up of industry members, right? To, to. Correct. Yeah. Not quite accurate, but yeah. Anyone, any, <laughs> I'm sure yeah, that there'll be people. Member of the yeah, there are. I think, um, uh, uh, regardless what and, further industry there is. Yes, in. and, and it goes all the way through, the, by the way, all the way down to Silver, numbers, which, which, is, which you know, Microsoft, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, Meta, but, or at least my consultants, uh, Huawei, yeah. um, that's and right. a bunch of others. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> them to name. and I think um, that yeah. Rust, yeah. the foundation's also opening the door very slightly to individuals, but that might be people who are associated very heavily with the project. Is yeah. that correct? Well, thank you. Mm. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. And the reason why I brought that up is because there's this relationship between, or at least 
there's a distinction um, okay. between there the Rust discussion? Foundation, the legal entity um, that is funded by corporate members made up from industry players, etc., etc., and, cetera, which ones are public and, which and ones are not. the Rust project. But there certainly project. has been discussion of that for some time. What is? How does the? How do people in the Rust community <laughs> describe the? What does the term Rust project mean? Right. Yeah, it's it's really impossible. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is something we've still been trying to figure out because it's well, it's pretty nebulous, and it always has been. Exactly, and and uh, yeah, you know, a loose I had such a tantrum when I, I saw that the all hands was being recreated with the same the name. At I was like, that is such an exclusionary list, way to describe I think people. that I'm meeting. Not entirely certain, um, um, and that's still pretty nebulous. Uh, say, <laughs> it's like, saying it, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was like, well, you know, that mm -hmm. we could have yeah. given it a different name, team. But but I think yeah. the Yeah, I applied for the all hands and I, as leader of this big of rest, I, I hope I get in. <laughs> elements of the, like, the Mozilla area. You have to apply for it. Yeah. I think this yeah. week in X is kind of one of the last remaining things of like the Mozilla culture that's still mm -hmm. very heavily rust. And I think the name all hands kind of has but um but sorry, I keep getting diverted. So the foundation is a steward yeah. for the language it holds the trademark and a few bank accounts which can receive money right. and distribute money because its mandate is to yeah. ship it or at least promote and kind of grow, I don't remember the exact wording, the Rust project, which is kind of yes. a hard thing to define. The it is, and it's something we, I think, we're continually trying to define. You know, what is a, a pressing need of the project? I mean, one early example was uh, the. Uh, On-call team for crates.io was two volunteers originally. Not it was just so. I mean, everyone pulls from crates.io. That was not sustainable and not fair. So one of the first things the Rust Foundation did was, you know, hire a company and establish a pay. I mean, this was not people who had already contributed to the Rust mm. project. A mm. paid yeah, because on-call the system. Tra uh, least, that the, had a schedule that no one was on call uh, all the time something. and um, was managed. So that was I an associate early the term Rust project for people who are like actively contributing to the not compiler just to or the standard Rust libraries. Project, but to so this every would be user people that are Rust. in Zulip, kind of reading and responding to RFCs. But I, but it would be weirdly larger than people with commit access to, let's say, the Rust Lang GitHub org, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. I I don't have contrib or commit access to the wrestling GitHub org, and I I do very much consider myself a member of the project. I think one of the difficulties mm. in the early days of the foundation was. Some people interpret it, you know, foundation would announce something and some people would interpret it as if they weren't personally consulted, that meant the foundation had not consulted the project and something that was desperately needed. And it is going you know, better now is to establish communications channels, you know, something the foundation that staff has said, and I've said, you know, too, I can't, you know, I just told you I'm not on Twitter for mental health reasons. I cannot monitor and the foundation staff cannot monitor every single thing that someone says on the, about the foundation on a social media platform they try to and but there is an official foundation channel within the rust lang zulip that people that is very that is active uh i monitor that other members of the board monitor that where people can pose questions or where right. people can bring concerns about the rust foundation so that's an example of a channel of communication uh also something that frustrated me actually when I first came to Microsoft was so much of the 
hierarchy of who you should go to what or who you should consult before you do something lives in people's heads. And it takes a long time to get to understand that. And I only understand that for maybe 0.5% of Microsoft at this point. I've been there uh, coming up on four years. It was similar with the Rust Project. This was a group of people who've been working together in a fairly organic way and it organically grown for a long time. So foundation staff is, you know, some people who have been involved with the Rust community for a while, but a lot of people who haven't, but who have expertise in things like fundraising in things like establishing bylaws and teaching them how to figure out who in the Rust community they needed to talk to about what was difficult. And so that also brought the need for some sort of official communication channels. Mm. Where I'm curious is we've gone through a period where things look like we've hit a stable equilibrium slightly. We just, like, we've just had a really successful conference, Rust Forge. I was not able to attend this year, but um, I think that was that's apparently a just, a, just, just a resounding success. Yeah, it was seamless. Uh, it was seamless from both me as the MC's perspective and from the speakers and attendees' perspective. The foundation staff did a phenomenal job with the logistics of it. Um, and... Then we have like other bits and pieces, but like I don't want to ask you how the foundation and the project will evolve into the future, but I'm curious if whether you have any principles to decide on that step. Like, are we the right setup, or are we uh, are we advocating for our stakeholders in the way that we should be? Um, the approach that you'll take. Is that clear? Yeah, it is. And the biggest, you know, and this was, you know, part of the original bylaws when the foundation was established, but the biggest way to try and keep some balance, at least, between the project and the corporate, you know, sponsors, directors of, uh, or of the Rust Foundation is on the board. There's always a mix of project directors, of people who represent the project specifically, and people like myself who represent the corporations who sponsor uh, the Rust Foundation. And any vote, uh, you know, a significant vote requires a two-thirds majority of both of those groups. And that's one of the key parts to try to keep some balance in there. Uh, as for how to evolve and grow, it's hard to say. I'm certain Beck has a, a five-year plan. Uh, Beck and the other members have a five-year plan. But the way I see it is... Continuing to focus on maintainer health. Uh, you know, we saw a significant security issue within the open source world around the XZ utility uh, recently. And I think uh, we don't have quite enough time to go into the specifics of, of that. But part of what led to that was someone, you know, a maintainer who was burning out and very clearly was, you know, being approached by someone who, you know, was on it for a while, for a good while, I think it was over a year, appeared to be a very helpful, very good maintainer, but then introduced something malicious to, to that. And part of the reason for that vulnerable or into that project, part of the reason for that, you know, maintainer burnout, I used to say is a business liability. It's also a security liability. So what I see is the foundation continuing to focus on maintainer health. It's growing things like the grants program where people can earn money for the, the work that they do on Rust, continuing to hire more developers to steward the Rust ecosystem so people can, you know, be paid for it. And in the U.S., at least, uh, you have health benefits. Those are tied to our employer most of the time. And I'm not going to go on a rant on that right now. But that's how I see it can continuing to evolve, is stewarding maintainer health in the Rust ecosystem and also stewarding the health of the infrastructure, technical infrastructure uh, of the Rust ecosystem, as well as the security of it. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much, Nell, for your time. I've really enjoyed listening and learning. And it struck me that there have been several instances in which you've really demonstrated some of those values that you have, um, you aspire to. You've essentially disconnected from places that are toxic for you. So I think that's a really positive step. You've, uh, as a leader of the um, the you know, the lead editor of the, it's like, well, actually, no, we don't need to do job postings. It's too difficult for us. I think that 
um, taking that mentality into your other endeavors is, is really helpful. And I think that the health of the entire Rust ecosystem will benefit from it. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for having this resource for the Rust community, this podcast. Thank you.